Well, a lot of people these days think of meditation as a good thing and something they want to try and something that might be useful to make them calm or make them better at taking tests or these kind of things or becoming more mindful. It's very trendy these days. And a lot of people think it's a nice option to have uh, out there. But I think meditation isn't just optional for human beings. I think it's actually necessary and we have been for too long uh, neglecting it. Um, it's just as necessary as exercise or... Thank you again. This is Brad Warner for the last seminar of our Embodied Interaction Seminary Series, looking at different aspects of embodied interaction. And our focus with Brad has been around especially uh, cogitate and the, you know thinking in new ways or non-thinking, as it were, in this case, and also the relationship to what we call discomfort design and discomfort as a necessary material towards adaptation. So we've got a few questions to come back to around that in part two. The link for part one is in the Slack channel. It's also in the invite for the calendar event here. Okay, so as you all come in, we're gonna review a little bit, Brad, if that's okay, from, from some of the concepts we touched on last time. And so, just just as a connect, we talked about zazen sitting sitting. It's not called sitting meditation, is it? It's it's sitting something. Sitting zazen usually. So so then the term zazen translates as what? Uh, sitting meditation. It is so sitting the, meditation. Yeah, the the zen part is from the word dhyana, which a Sanskrit chana. word, yeah, or chana, depending on how you say it. Right. And right. the za is the Japanese uh, sit, just means sit. And how is that, um, how is shikantaza a subset of that? There are two major forms of, of Zen Buddhism. There, there's actually more than two, but, you know, uh, there, are, there are two that are, are the ones you're most likely to encounter, which is Rinzai and Soto. And I studied in the Soto sect. Uh, mm -hmm practices shikantaza, which is the just sitting style. In the Rinzai form, uh, they also do shikantaza, but in addition to shikantaza, they do another practice. Uh, I've forgotten the formal name, but usually it's, it goes by names like koan introspection or koan practice. Mm -hmm. And the koans are those uh, crazy questions that you come across in Zen books sometimes, uh, what is the sound of one hand clapping? Um, what was the shape of your face before your parents were born? You know, these kind of weird questions. And <clears throat> they will sit with those questions and then present an answer to uh, their teacher in a, in a sort of a ritualized uh, ritual. <laughs> Um, we, in Soto style Zen, we don't do that. So I don't know a whole lot about that practice, just what I've read in books or, or heard from people who've done it uh, here and there. That's so, cool. so that, yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's pretty clear that just sitting is just darn important in Soto Zazen. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, the, it's the major practice. And as I okay. said last time, it's just sitting. So the idea is to try to pare your experience down to just getting deeply into the practice of sitting still. Nothing but sitting still. So also I've, I've heard you and others say that Zazen in this respect or Shikantaza is not meditation. It's not meditation. Yeah, yeah uh, I think most people who say that are referencing a line from Dogen's work, uh, Genjo Koan, where he says, um, Oh, darn it. Now I can't remember the quote, but he says something to that effect. Um, he says something more like Zazen practice is not. Oh God, the word he uses has something to do with concentration. I can't remember the translation, but it's it's um, it's to distinguish it from a practice in which what you were supposed to do is develop a high level of concentration. So usually meditation generally tends to refer to a practice of usually and again this is not a practice i've ever done i've just read about it but it usually involves coming up with an object um, i think in tibetan buddhism they often use a mandala which is a kind of a, a weird 
a design with a lot of patterns on it and they stare at that. Uh, I, I believe in some of the Hindu forms of meditation, they'll look at candles or they'll, they'll do um, mantras. So they have a word and you're supposed to concentrate your all of your energy on just uh, thinking of that word. Um, we don't do that in the, in the kind of zazen that I that I practice. So uh, I don't know much about that. But, but the Dogen was not a, a big fan of these uh, high concentration practices because they they sort of take you out of ordinary life. They're they're kind of pulling you into a special experience. And, it, and if you want to have a special experience, from what I hear, uh, those kind of concentration practices can uh, often result in special experiences. Uh, and, but what we're working with in Zazen is trying to find the root of all experience, like the, whether it's the special experience of uh, an enlightenment or, or some kind of trance state or, or various other words they'll use samadhi is often used for that uh, sort of a state although dogen liked to redefine the word samadhi as referring to just zazen you know whether whether it feels <laughs> yeah, like yeah. samadhi or not it's that's that's samadhi he writes a, a an article or a, an essay called the the king of samadhis and the king of samadhis turns out as you'd expect if you've ever read dogen to be just sitting zazen uh, not not a special state that is encountered in that practice, but uh, but the practice itself. Could, could you? Yeah, that's 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 dandy. Just just sitting, yeah. or uh, to to quote a, an eloquent Zen master, sit down and shut up. <laughs> also uh, seems to fit in there. One thing. Well, I have a couple of questions, but before we get to to those, what you just touched on about the special experience as opposed to the root of all experience. Also goes by the name reality. In this, yeah. this, this, can you, you know, it's odd to ask somebody to describe reality, but it seems like there's, there's, you know, the mental, the physical, and then there's reality. And I'm yeah. just wondering if there's a way to kind of help us approach why the uberness would be reality, which sounds really good, actually. It's really nice to think we're in that right now and that somehow it's, removing whatever the filters are between us and what's right here right now that's the idea and that's the the way my teacher usually phrased it would, would be we are living in reality uh, we are not living in our thoughts and we are not living in the world of sense perceptions cool. and usually we vacillate from one to the other and western culture for the past Oh God, thousand years or something. I don't know when the Renaissance happened, maybe less than a thousand years ago, but has embraced this idea of saying that what in the Zen terms would be called sense perception is, is reality. So matter is regarded in the Zen philosophy as being sense perception. So we don't, we don't, we don't, Let's see. Philosophically speaking, Zen doesn't say that there's there there may be a world, there may be a real world, there may be a material world out there, you know, with this cup I'm holding, might be a real thing, but all we actually know about it is the the sense perception, that what we're seeing, what I'm feeling, what what I'm smelling, because it had um, Bengal spice in there, so it's all uh, sense perception, um, but uh, whether whether there is a real cup or not is is questionable. So what we're trying to do is is find the reality that is uh, behind all of that, or we, uh, not necessarily find. We're we're admitting that there is a reality behind that that may be ineffable. You know that's the uh, that's the phrase that, or the word that my uh, teacher was uh, fond of. Um, I had never really. I think I'd heard the word ineffable a couple of times before I met my my first teacher, but I heard it a lot once he uh, once he came into my life. And Dogen writes an essay called Inmo, which is uh, could be translated as the ineffable. It's sometimes translated as suchness, but it's actually a, an old Chinese word. I don't think it's even used by the Chinese anymore. 
but it just it means something you can't you can't name like 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 the word something you know uh so it's my teacher titled his version of of uh, his translation of that essay it but you could also translate it as something and this something is is reality and reality is not describable you can describe your sense perceptions and you can describe your thoughts but reality is uh, is beyond that so we are we are trying to accord with this living reality that we exist in but and that we are not separate from this is the other thing we we sort of uh, have this image or i guess i do uh, often that that i am something that confronts reality so reality is an object and i am the subject and we're breaking down that subject and object dichotomy and saying okay there's just there's just reality so it gives you a very different way of uh, understanding yourself and the world. Real still feels good. Can I can I try an idea on you and see if this resonates? Is it? Um, I'm interested when there there are when you have the expression words fail me, and we've touched on before the notion of translation, and that every translation is kind of like just it's a lens from a particular direction on something, but they don't the Japanese version and the English version don't not necessarily match up in the same way or show you exactly the same thing. And it seems like from what you're saying about reality, it's like the best we can do with the perceptions that we have is, is kind of try to translate something that's much more than what we have the right words for. And you'd have to put a whole lot of languages together to try to get a bigger picture, but it still wouldn't necessarily cover it. And in fact, it might just get in the way of the itness. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's beyond language and there's a there's a concept it come it comes out of uh, Hinduism and I'm going to botch it because it only just came across it a couple of months ago and I found it fascinating because they in the Advaita Vedanta tradition they break down speech in, in a way that is is very similar to things I've encountered with the with the Zen practice which is that a word is first formed or a concept is first formed in your mind without any any words and it has it has nothing and then it, it goes through four stages and then the the uh the, the fourth stage is, is often translated as words explode out um of the of the reality so i don't know what i'm where i'm going with this the 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 words are useful uh tools and, uh, uh, they break. Ooh, now I the robot. Abdukar, could you please? Yeah, mute. That's great. Okay, go ahead. Uh, you break reality up into fragments in order to work with those fragments. That's what words do. So you you know you say you say cup. Well, there's there's one continuous reality which includes the cup. But if I want to talk about the cup, I have to have a word for it. So I I uh, I have a word for it. Uh, this is. Uh, when they were storming Area 51, this is the commemorative cup that they issued. But that never, they yeah, they never stormed Area 51. Um, so um, yeah, uh, what was that going for? Words and yeah. words and reality so, and limitedness. Yes, yeah, so the words the words necessarily limit reality, and every word contains within it everything it, it opposes. So this is why, uh, especially sticky words uh, like love and truth and beauty and all these things that religions sort of uh, emphasize and even Buddhism emphasizes them uh, are also also include their opposites. So you have to kind of uh, be careful with words. And I think it helps to understand their the functional aspect of words uh, beyond beyond believing <laughs> the words. So you can't believe your own words. I'll go for that. Uh, that that surprisingly helps uh, in terms of I think situating a context. I would have one last question about that. Is in your experience, especially when you've talked or written about um, things related to what folks might call enlightenment experiences, have you found yourself not even trying to express them? I'm just thinking, 
sometimes when you get to that place where, you, where you're not really using words, you're just kind of experiencing things that that having words go away is not a bad thing in terms of getting a little closer to the real. Yeah, it's not a bad thing. And I would say that in my experience working with this practice for years, um, there are moments when words just slip away and reality is is apparent. Uh, the 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 uh, caveat to to that is always to avoid thinking one situation is necessarily better than the other. It, it's I think I think it's good for those of us who have grown up not knowing that there was another way of experiencing reality to experience reality that is beyond words. And that can be an extraordinarily powerful experience, depending on what, you know, how, how far you, you're able to go into it. Um, you know, for, for me, the first few times it happened, it seemed mind blowing. And then, and then you go, okay, there's another level even beyond this. And it seems to kind of go on infinitely. So you can once you remove the words, you have a you have this in, infinite um, expanse, but you have no way to uh, express that. So you kind of you're kind of trying to balance both uh, sides there. Uh, probably just uh, it's teaching challenging, I would imagine. Yeah, because you're trying to point to something that that can't be expressed, but um, you only have that one tool you have to use words to do it which is why Dogen was an interesting character because he often referred to that experience by, beyond words but he wrote a lot of words <laughs> you know he really devoted his life to trying to express this thing in language uh, and and he developed a very unique sort of language even even if you're a native speaker of Japanese and you try to read his words in the original, this is what fascinated my own teacher about Dogen was that he said when he first came across Dogen's writings, it was something written in his own language that he could not understand. And that that piqued his curiosity when he was like, a, I think he, he says he was like 15 or 16 years old when he first read anything by Dogen. And, and he was just... Uh, it became his mission and it really became his life's work to try to understand this this book because you, you look at it and you it's almost like it's written in a code and mm -hmm. most of us who read Dogen you can tell it's not written by a, a crazy person but in a lot of ways it, it it resembles what you might get from you know somebody who's schizophrenic or something I don't want to insult it but you know it's so strange that uh -huh. it's it's um it, it, it sounds like it's coming from another world entirely, but uh, it's it's his attempt to try to try to express in words something that is fundamentally inexpressible. So that's cool. we'll come back to that because it comes back to the question for later around there's no shortcuts and where you know technologies have tried to come in to say oh let we can help you shortcut to that experience wordlessly by using other modes that which is the sensory ones that you're talking about but we'll come back to that an okay. easy word question is that uh, zazen is referred to often as a practice yeah. and just just to that word has various resonances whether it's a musician practicing or or a doctor or a professional doing a practice can you just Explain a little bit about why you think zazen would be referred to as a practice in particular. There's not even in religious studies you don't necessarily hear about nuns having a practice. They they yeah you know well I think this is what's uh, what's remarkable about uh, Zen and, and probably a lot of the Eastern philosophies have this as well. So it may not be unique to Zen but it's certainly different from Western philosophy. For example, my teacher was very fond of the existentialists. Uh, I can't mm -hmm. remember which ones in, in specifically. Kierkegaard, he, Sartre. Yeah, yeah. I, I know he had some Kierkegaard and, and maybe Heidegger. Yeah. I, 
So, so, but what he would always say about those uh, philosophies is that they lacked a practice. Um, except his <laughs> his opinion of Nietzsche was Nietzsche de- never had a practice, which is why he went so terribly wrong with it. So he was on the right track, right? But but he kind of uh, because he didn't have a, a practice, he only had the intellectual side. And if you if you uh, keep going into the intellectual side, it can only take you so far. And what happened with Nietzsche is, is it took him, you know, to, you know, to the space where he could have um, gotten somewhere if he'd had a practice around it, but then cool. he tried to think his way through it and it, it just went terribly wrong, you know? So that's, uh, so so the difference is in, in Zen is we do have a, a philosophical basis which you can go and read about in a book uh, uh, and and that's fine, and you can learn a lot from those books. And Dogen wrote tons of books, so he wasn't uh, disregarding or or uh, you know downplaying the the function that those can have, the intellectual side. But he also had a practice. So every day he was doing this zazen practice. So he wasn't just trying to think his way through. Um, he was actually. One of uh, one of my teacher's teachers, Kodo Sawaki, said the entirety of Buddhist philosophy is a footnote to Zazen. So it's it's trying to explain what comes out of the practice of, of Zazen rather than trying to intellectually, you know, logic, you know, logic it out, <laughs> you know, figure it out logically. You, you do this practice that you um, and and why it's called a practice, you know, there's a, there's a um, unfortunate tendency with the word practice to you know practice makes perfect. Uh, mm. you know, the idea mm. of a practice is you practice until you get it right, and then you don't right. have to practice anymore because now you've got it. And mm. so that's um, so it's not that kind of practice. It's a practice that you keep working on. And in 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 music, it would make. Uh, the the analogy kind of works because uh, you might you might practice enough to get one piece of music uh, right, but that doesn't mean you you got everything. So you continue to work on on your music practice uh, rather. As you than, said last time, you can't even play as well regularly if you're not also practicing. Well, yeah, that's the that's the problem. And that's the problem I have because I don't practice enough uh, lately. So I used to play several hours a day, and now I, you know, it's a couple, an hour a week maybe, if on a good week. Um, so you, so you lose it. So you know, and I've lost a lot of my abilities there, and I don't, I don't practice my Japanese much anymore. So uh, things that I, I could read ten years ago, I can't read anymore, which is disappointing. And to, to wrap this around to what you said last time about you noticed. Um, the benefits of, of zazen when you had stopped practicing yeah. for a while, and so I'm I'm guessing yeah. that is part of the same loop is that right. you have to be feeding that all the time to keep. Yeah, it. it's a it's a very similar sort of uh, sort of thing. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so we're gonna we've got a few questions from from last time around uh, discomfort that will co- cover. Uh, related to this actually is is it, again with the notion of discomfort we talked a little bit about boredom as one of the the sort of starting point um, issues around discomfort and the question is uh, do you, does the does the kind of discomfort and you sort of touched on this last week but does the kind of discomfort change over um, a period and 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 uh, are are there places that you would look that, or does the discomfort, and this was also came out of the description of your um, retreat experience, where you, you keep continually hit the, I want to run away screaming from this experience. It sounds like it's kind of the same thing repeatedly, or or does the experience change? Like, it's no longer it's that it's boring, or it's no longer that I can't sit here. It's just, it's something else is going on that makes me want to stop this. And it's not necessarily that your ankle's sore from being twisted in lotus for 16 hours. Well, there is, um, it does change. It, it changes continuously. I, I think if you watch it closely, it changes moment by moment. So cool. any, any feeling of discomfort 
is a temporary a temporary experience so you just kind of uh, go go through it and get to the end of it and i i suppose you know in in very basic terms i think when i first sat zazen just sitting just doing 20 minutes was extremely uh, uncomfortable and now it's usually not uh to you know i can usually sit for 40 minutes without experiencing any any real uh, discomfort but that that changes from day to day certain days it's uh, it's very uncomfortable but i go through it anyway but you mean physically or mentally or both um well mostly mentally there's a bit of physical discomfort you know the, in in zazen because it's a physical practice there are a few things to be careful about one of them is is knee pain uh, it's, it, it's about the only thing I've ever heard of anybody actually injuring themselves through Zazen practice is, is uh, trying to do the, um, you mentioned the lotus posture. I, I uh, was flexible enough to do the lotus posture, to, do, to be able to do full lotus, but what I didn't uh, realize at the time was I was kind of putting stress on my knees. So now I no longer do the full lotus posture because I, I realized I was hurting myself over time uh, doing that just because I'd be walking around going, oh, you know, right. uh, with, with the knee pain. But um, so so you got to watch that and there are workarounds for that. You know, I don't want to go into all that detail about the different workarounds, but there are workarounds. So generally speaking though the the discomfort isn't isn't that physical discomfort so so there is there's a bit of physical discomfort just involved in in trying to stay still you know that that doesn't that isn't that doesn't have anything to do with injuring yourself or or any sort of um, physical uh, pain there's there's also a, a certain things that the mind will do that i've noticed in retreats i remember one in particular stands out in my memory that I was having a terrible pain in, I think my thighs or calves, I can't remember, it wasn't in the knees. And so because the pain wasn't in my knees, I decided I'm just gonna, I'm not gonna do anything about it. I'm just gonna keep on sitting. And the pain was excruciating, but then a bell rings to end the 40 minutes of, of Zazen and I stood up and immediately, uh, that pain was gone. So I can only surmise from that experience that what was going on was my mind was grabbing on to some pain that was probably under ordinary circumstances would have been barely noticed and magnifying it uh, because uh, because the mind there's 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 stuff going on in the subconscious level this is one of the things you get into with zazen that that uh, during a uh, other experiences this is why zazen is special you don't notice you know you don't notice that all this stuff is going on but when you sit still for longer periods you uh, begin to notice these these things that are happening so so at the so my subconscious is inventing a pain uh, because i'm trying to look for any excuse to to stop doing this you know, so in the initial, you know, initial practice of Zazen, it was more of a, a thing in, in the conscious mind going, oh, I just want to get out of here, I want to get out of here, I want to get out of here. Mm -hmm. Once I've gotten over that, there's these subconscious versions of the same thing started to appear. You know, phantom mm -hmm. pain didn't really exist and things like that start mm -hmm. to start to appear. And, um, and it's amazing how, how, powerful that stuff can be and no having noticed that going on uh, has made me just aware of it as a, a factor that runs throughout my life you know so I don't necessarily trust um, my first impressions of, of a situation like this is you know this is terrible I have to kind of go well okay maybe this discomfort I'm having is 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 not relevant and also, you know, the, the feeling that I could be doing anything other than what I'm doing right now can be very powerful, but I find that's not reliable either. I'm only doing what I'm doing right now, and that's what I'm doing. And the idea that I could be doing something else 
which used to really pull me away, I, I realized I can't be doing something else because I'm doing this. <laughs> Actually, Again, what is like reality? What's now? What what does that mean? Yeah, now is sort of uh, what did I hear? Oh no, say I can never remember my quotes when I try to come up with them. But uh, Nishima Roshi would say something like the the present moment is where that material side and the I idea side come together. So that's so that's what the present moment is. So your 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 thinking and your and your um, sensory experience are happening at this moment. So you can you can imagine another time and and you can work towards a better situation, uh, for example. But you have to do that now. So that's that that's the beauty of it because you you can say. I mean, I don't know everybody's situation at that everybody's present moment, but I know I've been in situations that were bad and needed to be changed. But the only way that was going to happen was through action in this moment. And and kind of rejecting the present moment has never been a winning strategy. <laughs> you know, it's just it's just always it's it's always um, yeah, it's always the the it's never it, it never works so accepting the present moment is is extremely important even okay. if you <laughs> does the analogy not work at all you know how you have to it, it's difficult at first to learn how to balance riding a bike for those who have who've done that with a two-wheeler but once you've got it it's so in your body maybe this is what it, having that experience of, of uh, reality of enlightenment is like it's like once you've got it it's bang it's it's there you know what it is and even if you're not riding the bike you know you can get back on it and, and you're not going to fall off again i'm just mm. wondering if that analogy has any resonance or you just say no actually there's always struggle or no that you, there's no bike riding analogy in, in zazen it's constantly working on i wouldn't say the analogy I don't think there's I don't think it's completely irrelevant, but there is because there's there's a tendency for people who do Zen practice to have a special experience, an experience of, of total balance, and then to assume <clears throat> that this uh, has fixed everything. And I mm. went I think everybody who's gone through these experiences has said, I, I've never heard anybody who didn't make that same mistake. Uh, and some people uh, carry on making that mistake and can really screw things up because uh, they, they underestimate the, the power of, of their, their karma, of their past, you know, and, uh, and, uh, and assume that everything's been erased. On the other hand, there there is a a sense that once once discovering that balance is there, at least in my experience, has been I can't deny it anymore. Uh, so so it it changes from being an ab abstraction. I, I remember one of my first uh, experiences of that was to to say, oh. My teachers were telling the truth, <laughs> you know, up until that moment, I had had a, a, a bit of doubt, you know, like, like, mm. OK, I'm going to I'm going to try this out. And I do trust my teachers and I do um, I do want to keep working on this. But there's always a chance that I'm that we're all deluded, that that my teachers don't even know what the hell they're talking about. And then to kind of hit that point and go. Oh, this is what they've been talking about. This isn't this is an illusion. This is this is a real thing. Uh, changed everything for me. You know, it's just I, I couldn't uh, I couldn't go back anymore. You know, there was no there was no going back. But that doesn't imply that there is now a permanent um, like the the permanent ability to just find it again. So that's where the ana the bike analogy kind of falls flat because anytime mm -hmm. I, I want to ride a bike, I know I can, I'm reason I haven't ridden a, a bicycle. My last bicycle got stolen about four years ago and I haven't, I haven't replaced it <laughs> yet. Um, was it four? Maybe it was a little less than that. But anyway, 
uh, used to ride all the time. But anyway, I'm reasonably confident that if I got on a bicycle again, I wouldn't fall. <laughs> you right. Know? Uh, exactly. Whereas, uh, you know, in, in any any time, any day, I could probably ride a bicycle. Uh, whereas this this thing that I'm talking about, this kind of balance point, is a little. Um, I think it's a finer balance point than the kind of balance that you need to ride a bike, and so it is. It, it does take a lot more care to uh, to be able to find it again. Some folks have have noticed that that um, when they have meditated, that this has helped other parts of their lives in mm. in terms of other practices. So one of the comments was about running. So I've noticed when I have meditated that by having that, I can get through different parts that have been challenging and in, in runs. And have there have you noticed beside you talked last time about the the coping better with an experience that for other people was causing great consternation and you're kind of like not affected by that you still responded to it dealt with it professionally but you weren't getting all triggered by it and other than that kind of equanimity not that that is anything to sneeze at have you noticed that your practice has affected um, any other practice or process that you could say this has caused these adaptations it's definitely because of this doing zazen well yeah yeah there it does and bef before i i go into it i'll just say it again you got it you got to be careful not to at least that's my experience not to think that you fixed everything because of this right. but uh, a couple a couple examples was um or this is uh, this is going back a few years, but um, I I made records. Uh, uh, it, this was like a passion of mine since uh, teenagers. I used to make these uh, albums on on little cassette tapes when I was fourteen and fifteen years old. There'd only be one copy of them. Later on, I found out Daniel Johnson made a whole career out of out of doing just that. But um, that's a whole other story. Uh, I didn't uh, I didn't think of it as as a, as a career. But um, so I was very passionate about it. But and and I made some records in the 80s for a, a, a label called Midnight Records, independent label. And then I moved to it got very frustrating because I was never able to make a living at it, and I didn't know how. Uh, to make that happen. And so in kind of a fit of frustration, I gave up, moved to Japan and took a teaching teaching job over there. So, and I also kept practicing Zazen. And after practicing Zazen and having a few of these experiences, I realized that I was thinking about it wrong. The joy in creating those albums was the, the joy the same as when I had when I was 14. There didn't need to be, they didn't need to be on a label, you know, with a bunch of people listening to them and I, I didn't care anymore who heard the records and I made this this album uh, in the late 90s and when I was living in Japan that I think to date maybe 10 people have heard this and I know one of them liked it a lot I had this one friend <laughs> telling me how much he liked it and so between me and him two people really liked that album and nobody else ever heard it and i haven't made any any uh concerted effort to to promote it or anything it's just uh well, well no it's not even here <laughs> i put it on a cdr and i used to listen to it a lot and it became one of my favorite records uh, because i made exactly the music that i wanted to hear which is what i which is what i had done when i was a teenager it was just it was because there was music that i wanted to hear that uh, some professional artists were coming close to, but nobody had got it quite right. So I made it myself, you know, for my own benefit. And so divorcing that from, divorcing the uh, creation of something from the results was was the thing. And, and this also led to the publication of, of my first book, Hardcore Zen. I had uh, tried to be a writer for years also this is something that I was passionate about in my teens and I would write short stories and things and I I uh, wrote novels that I would send out to publishers and they they would send them back to me and when I wrote the book that became hardcore zen I had 
I had gotten over that idea of worrying about whether it was going to be published or not. So, so it was completely free of any effort, even the slightest effort to try to produce something that was publishable. I did not care. I just wrote uh, with, uh, with total honesty. And the only reason it was published is because I had gone through the process of, you know, like I said, I tried, tried to write novels. So I knew what you, I knew how you sent a book to a publisher and, and, you know, begged them to put it out. So I, uh, I did that, but I, I, I actually had no, I, I, I think I remember going, I picked out like seven publishers I was going to send it to. And my plan was once it's rejected by those seven publishers, I'm just going to put it away. Uh, and one of those seven publishers wanted to publish it, which surprised the hell out of me. Cause I, I just thought I didn't, I didn't even imagine that was a possibility. So, uh, so it was useful to forget about the results. So that's what, that's what Sazen is, is about. It's a goalless practice. So you're not you're not doing the practice in order for something else to happen. Uh, you're doing the practice for its own sake. This is what shikantaza means, just sitting. So you're just sitting. So doing any activity for the sake of itself seems to be, ironically, what produces the, the best uh, chances of it being useful. You know, writers can say this, a lot of musicians have a similar story. A lot of athletes have a similar story. They play basketball just because they love playing basketball. And um, but the problem is if you if you when you conflate it with success. So a person could play basketball for the pure joy of playing basketball and never make the NBA, you know, and it doesn't matter. You know, that's that's the thing. But but the problem is most of us give up. You know, that's what I've done with my musical career. I was just like, well, if I'm not going to make money on this, I might as well give it up. And I gave it up for years, but I was unhappy uh, having given it up because I really wanted to do it. And and I still, you know, the last piece of music I produced was called uh, Hello UFO Aliens. And if you go on um, YouTube, you can find a video I even made. Right. A cool song that I wrote and, and recorded uh, and then made a video for. Uh, and I had fun making it, but I, I didn't care that much whether it became a hit song or anything I just uh, just wanted to work on a song you know and I had this melody in mind uh, that I thought was, was nice I've seen technology now that you know you put in front of your eyes does yeah. stuff or you take drugs and it all is always compared to, wow, meditators will say that, you know, taking some psilocybin will take you to exactly where it took them 10 years to get with, with Zazen practice or longer. So, you know, get to that place now and it'll pay dividends. Just do the drugs. Yeah, yeah the, short, the shortcut things, the best analogy I've come up with is mountain climbing, which I've never really climbed a mountain. But the, the, the analogy often used by, by those folks, and, and this is where I got it from, is, is like you, it's, it's, um, it's like taking a helicopter to the top of the mountain. You know, you bypass all the, all the difficulty of climbing it and you get the same experience of, of the top of the mountain. But that, that is an insult to, to mountaineering, I think. I don't think a mountain climber climbs a mountain just because they want the experience of being on top of the mountain because because they they also know that you can take a helicopter you know the mountain climbers aren't dumb you know it's not like they they don't realize you could take a helicopter up to the top of uh, I don't know whatever mountain it is the, the Everest or whatever you know you could um, you could you could take a you could take a, an airplane way higher than that you know and look down <laughs> on everything you know um, but that's not uh, that's that's not what they're doing it for. They're not doing it for the view that you get from the top. They're doing it for the whole, the entire experience. So it's the same way with the, the Zen experience. And it's a totally different thing to climb a mountain on, under your own you know, power and get to the top and look out than it is to 
to uh, take a helicopter up there. It's not the same experience. I mean, you can say it's the same view, you know, visually speaking, I guess it would be the same view, but that would be the only, the only thing it would compare uh, would, be, would be the view. The rest of it doesn't compare at all. So it's the same thing with these these technologies. I've tried a couple of them. A few a few people have talked me into trying. Um, I remember a few shortcut meditation things, and I, I found them all annoying. Uh, there was one <clears throat> that was looked like a like a pair of really weird sunglasses uh, that had lights in them, and then there was a set of headphones you had to put on. And you're supposed to uh, put this these weird sunglasses and the headphones on and close your eyes and it was going to give me a meditative experience and i just found it it, it the the it was like listening to the worst uh, electronic uh, music that i ever listened to like the most pointless beeps and bloops and 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 the world's most uh, boring light show you know <laughs> that's mm. what i that's what mm. i can compare it to it didn't 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 make me feel meditative at all i think it was called binaural beats or something like that i, I forget um <clears throat> you know they were very whoever had set this up was pretty uh, excited about this technology and and how uh, and, and and i i had to just say honestly this is you know i just found it annoying the, the sensory deprivation tank is this tank where you're, you're well you know what it is but in case people listening don't it's uh, you're floating in in salt water that's exactly at your body temperature and it's in a dark uh, sort of a capsule sort of thingy and and you just sort of uh, lay there and it was very pleasant but uh, they couldn't insulate it enough because uh, I could hear people walking the the sounds of the sounds of shoes on on floors was traveling somehow into the into the thing so i wasn't getting the full sensory deprivation cuz i could constantly hear people walking around in this building um so uh so uh, maybe maybe if i maybe if they'd managed to shut that out it would have been a different experience but i just fell asleep after about 10 minutes i i fell asleep and then the, and they woke me up and i was like oh that was nice it was a nice nap <laughs> So, so that's yeah. the technology side. The big, big discussions lately are on the um, psychedelics. Yeah. Anything there? Yeah, I, 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 you know, I've done some psychedelics myself, and I've had some of those experiences, and I can see why people get excited about that. But again, it's something different. It's, it's, it, it, in in the ways that it's similar to so-called satori or kensho or enlightenment experiences um in in a superficial way i could say okay yeah it is somewhat similar but it also you you i find you need some grounding before you're ready for those experiences and i just did a video about this um uh, by using LSD, I, I came to the understanding of the eternal aspect of this moment. You know, it's, it's very easy to, to say it, and it's not a hard concept to grasp intellectually, but to actually, you know, get, get to the, that, you know, where you're feeling it deeply in your bones, that you really understand that the only moment is this moment is quite different. And at 19 years old on LSD, what that did was terrified me, you know, absolutely terrified me because what was going on at that moment was that I was having a bad trip on LSD and I just wanted it to be over. So I remember going through the process of looking at my watch, thinking about when I'd actually swallowed the acid, you know, doing the math and going, okay, I'll, I, I should be okay in about two hours. That, I remember that was the, you know, so I must have been, you know, however many six hours into the trip or whatever. I don't know how long it would normally took me to, to come down from it. Um, but, you know, four or six hours into the trip and I'm going, well, I, you know, in about two hours, I'll be okay. And I could not understand what two hours meant. Two hours was just an intellectual uh, construct and it had no no relevance to what I was experiencing at that moment, because two hours was just an abstraction, which is what Zen people usually find after, you know, 10 or more years of, of meditating, they'll, they'll come to the understanding that, that things like that are just abstractions. 
But the the nice thing about the Zen experience is you can still work with those abstractions. But what the LSD and what these other drugs, I'm sure ayahuasca and all the rest of them, DMT, are, are kind of work the same way, is it rips that away from you. By ripping it away from you, it it allows you to to see another aspect of reality. So, okay, I'll grant you that. But it is what we're working for in the Zen practice is, is, is coming to a balance of both where you can still, uh, use your, your, um, abstractions and concepts the way you always could, you know, and you can still drive a car, you know, and, you know, you can, you can do all the things that, that normal people can do, but you're also understanding this, um, you know, the eternal now and things like that. So I think, those those drug experiences the the best i can say for them is they might if if you're a person who's very obstinate they might knock you for enough of a a loop uh so as to say okay there is another side of reality and give you a, a, a a reason to work towards it but what seems to happen much more often is it's just tripping and tripping and tripping. I mean, this is, this is what I see from the people who advocate it. They, they mm -hmm. just never stop, you know, so they I, don't the, use it as a booster for practice. It's like, yeah. this becomes the way. Yeah. They just keep doing the drugs again and again and again. And it reminds me of, of, uh, Doritos, you know, the, the corn chips. Well, and we're talking to British people, so they're probably not. What's the British chips. It begins with like a W or anyway, Watkins or something. But anyway, the, the the experience of eating one of uh, one crisp is uh, is delightful, you know, and so you want to have that experience again. And you know, I was just eating a, a bowl of chips last night, so I know this. You know, you just you know, you're like, okay, I'm going to have that experience again, and I'm going to have that experience again, and I'm you know, so each chip is a is a nice experience. But if you're intelligent, you you stop. You know, you have you have your little. I've, I've come to uh, trust portion controlling on chips because I because I like <laughs> chips a lot, the crisps, you know. So um, and chips, I, I you know fries, I, I love those too. And I have to be careful with them because I will go, you know, I will go crazy with them. So, but if you're intelligent, you you just you you say I'm going to have this much and I'm going to stop. And and once you've had the experience, the next version of it is the same thing again, you know, the same. And you might, I'm not. I'm not absolutely against, I've come out really strongly in public because I think it's important for somebody in my position to be very harshly against uh, drugs, you know, as a, as a means for uh, attaining enlightenment. But it's, that's not to say, and I, I still add, maintain that, but it's not to say that I think um, research on uh, psychedelic drugs should stop and anyway even if i said that that wouldn't change anything so i don't know why anybody's worried that i would say that but people seem to be but no i i don't think it should stop in fact uh i i um, i'm a migraine sufferer you know i'm a person who suffers frequent migraines and there's this wonderful uh, medication uh, uh, triptans there's a whole family of triptan medications but apparently they are lsd i was reading about it and uh, somebody had noticed that LSD was really effective in controlling migraines, but you know, of course, you're you're tripping you know, like crazy, and so it's not uh, it's not very practical. So they had uh, managed to to figure out what part of the LSD controlled the migraines and get rid of the stuff that made you trip, and ironically called it the drug triptans. Um, and they're lovely. They're the only thing that I've ever had that works on my migraines. So the shortcut thing for a continuous meditation experience, not the same. You got to do the work. Discomfort seems to be a part of that process of getting mm -hmm. to um, the finer balance. It's not riding a bike, but it is this subtler, finer balance uh, mm -hmm. in the now to reality. And, and, you know, discomfort is, is part of any learning adaptation and it's going to be there in different ways at different times, different parts of the parts of the practice. But the payoffs of not trying to get any payoff are also pretty good in, yeah, in that sort of um, equanimity of uh, not being hung up on results. And good things seem to happen when you let go of wanting good things to happen. Yeah, and that's that's the interesting point, and it's it's one that I'm almost uh, reluctant to make, but it is definitely true. 
that uh, that there is a tremendous uh, results to be had by giving up the concept of results. Um, Funny that. Yeah, but okay. the problem is you, you can get into that loop where you're wanting the result of getting rid of results, and then you you kind of defeated your own. You know, so you really have to be serious about just forgetting uh, results, which is that that I find is the most, even even you know almost forty years into practice, I find that difficult to do sometimes. I'm gonna. Add, do you have one minute so I could ask you a question? Okay. Yeah. So this is thank you. This is related to kind of the the shortcuts and technologies, but something that that I I find very challenging is this whole guided meditation thing, and because mm -hmm. It it seems to be very popular, and it's certain again from our space and technology. Ooh, let's do an app for guided meditation. It's like, please, please don't. But I, it's, I get <laughs> so. But it it doesn't seem to resonate with what you've been talking about. So maybe they're different tra tra traditions. Maybe that's totally cool somewhere. But it it. I don't know how you do the work when you're doing a guided meditation. It's like you've got a Sherpa carrying you up the mountain instead of going up yourself, but you're still that, going up the mountain. It's kind of, yeah, that's, yeah, and that's a, actually a pretty good analogy. I wouldn't have thought of that, so so that's that's a good one. You, you just um, go have it, that one. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, yeah, it's, it's it, at, at best, it's the Sherpa carrying you up the mountain. It, could, it, it can even just be kind of a, a, a form of entertainment sometimes. Mm -hmm. Um, I, you know, I think guided meditation is, I, I don't want to come down too hard on it because I think there are uses for it therapeutically and, and so okay. forth. People yeah, can, okay. people can get something out of it. But if you really want to, if you really want to find what we're talking about in the Zen tradition, you have to get rid of the, the guidance, you know, the, because it can, it, it's, uh, you're, what is the you know counting somebody else's treasure or something like that you know i guess would be an analogy you know, you just kind of um you can, nobody can nobody can at, at some point nobody can guide you anymore so you know if you you got to do you got to do the rest of the work yourself so um every time i've done guided med in zazen we don't use guided meditation at all uh i did uh, a couple years ago, because I thought there was a lot of stress and you know stuff in the world, I put a YouTube video out with a guided meditation that I invented, um, and uh, a lot of people sort of enjoyed that. But I I hope they didn't just listen to it again and again and again. It was just you know for that moment, you know, to come to uh, to try to help some people out with with the stuff they were going through. So, so there is that usefulness of it, but but uh, we don't we don't have guidance. In fact, there is a a kind of a minor tradition in Soto called Kusen, in which a teacher will talk during zazen, and generally speaking, it's kept to just a, a sentence or two, you know, or maybe one word. But uh, my teacher was very much against even that. You know, he didn't. He, I remember him t talking one time about how he thought that was a practice that definitely should uh, be removed that we shouldn't uh, do that because i'm sure you've seen books that seem to say that they're in the soto zen tradition but they talk a lot about breath counting and whatnot it's kind of is that like training wheels for zazen or something well different teachers do it different ways you know my first okay. teacher um talked about breath counting and i used to do it but dogen there's a there's a passage in uh, his Ehe Koroku book in, in which he just, you know, rips on the, the practice of counting the breath as being not uh, not true zazen. So, you know, maybe it's not the worst thing you can do. And it, it is when you're first starting a practice, I, I did find it useful uh, because you're you having a strong habit of following your own thoughts is uh, is a problem and keeping counting the breath can kind of help uh, help you learn not to follow those thoughts you know because it's not mm -hmm. it's not something that, that comes easily to most of us uh, because we're just so you know, we've been kind of taught that way which right. we've been taught that, that we're supposed to follow those thoughts that, that come up in our minds and then you, you realize you don't have to follow them at all so yeah it, it's it's okay, but I, I think um, I think it's something that uh, I've had to abandon it. 
uh, I still do it. It's weird because the habit became ingrained in me enough over the first maybe 10 years of doing Zen practice where I would, would do that, um, not every time, but enough, that I, I find myself doing it. And it's a weird experience because I always notice it at about number four or five. So I'm like, I don't know where numbers one, two, and three went, but I must have counted one, two, and three to get to four and five. And I realized, oh, it, I'm counting again. You know, so so it does it does become something like that after a while, in which case I don't know what the value of it would be if it's just something that's kind of going on right. you know, <laughs> automatically like that. Just, you know. Habits do that yeah. kind of unconscious thing. I guess that's what makes them a habit is they're no longer conscious. Elegant right. here, which of your tomes would you recommend for folks to check out uh, starting this? Is it hardcore? Zen well, or... hardcore Zen is the most popular, so I I try to respect the fact that that it, it ha it's had longevity and it's really popular and people like it. Uh, to me, I, I I I feel like it's it's a good book, um, but it's it's uh, and it might maybe that's why it's good for people to start with because to me it reflects kind of where I was at 15 years ago. So I look at it now and I go. Mm, but um, but you know I think that's valid, uh, and and uh, the latest one is called Letters to a Dead Friend about Zen. And what I was attempting to do with Letters to a Dead Friend about Zen is to kind of do the same thing I'd done with Hardcore Zen. So Hardcore Zen, um, I told the story about how I decided it wasn't publishable. But I thought my my nephew, who was 14 at the time, was interested in meditation, and I I had pictured my nephew as as the person I was writing this book for because I thought possibly he would be the only one who would ever read it. Um, you know, literally the only one who would ever read it. Uh, so Letters to a Dead Friend about Zen is is uh, what I would have said to a, a close friend of mine who uh, died a couple of years ago, just a couple of years younger than me, um, passed away. And there was a, and he'd never been, he'd been around me the entire time, you know, we'd been friends the entire time and before, that I'd been a practitioner of Zen, but we and he was a very philosophical person, but we'd never talked about it because he was sort of this hard punk rock dude, you know, who uh, who wasn't uh, into such things. And after he died, I wrote this series of letters to him trying to explain my practice. And though these are these open letters to my dead friend about Zen, so those those are the two that I think are probably good entry level. But I actually think every one of my books, I've, I've tried very, to be careful not to make them like, you know, Harry Potter or Hunger Games series where you're going to, if you read book three, you're not going to know what the hell's going on. So that it's not like that. You could read any one of the books as, as your first book of mine, depending on, you know, if they strike your interest. There's nothing in there that builds, you know, in, in, I mean, I guess in a certain sense they build on each other, but not in a way that you couldn't um, enter, you know, the stream at any point. I can testify to that. I started with Don't Be a Jerk, oh, audiobook. Yeah. Uh, so we won't ask you for any closing words of wisdom. We'll just buy your freaking books. That would okay. be good for everybody. Yeah, and thanks. thank you very, very much for your time. There's probably questions that will come up on the Slack channel again. After this talk, I will share them with you as they come up. And thank yeah. you so much for spending the time with us to explore with designers and engineers the possibilities of embracing discomfort and getting nowhere but good with it. Hey, Mr. Spaceman, why don't you give us a sign? We'd love to hear from you. Hey, Mr. Spaceman, why don't you drop us a line? We'd love to hear from you about everything that you do. Can we do it too?